So welcome everybody to the second round table of today's conference on sharing best practices in local management of religious diversity. This is part one of this very interesting topic dealing with concrete examples and experiences. Um, you will see in your program that uh, tomorrow Friday in the morning you will have a second part of this um, sharing of best practices in the national context of Spain. So this is now dealing with international experiences. Thank you very much for your interest in this session and also your patience. Uh, I know we are in an unlucky position. We are the last one before the lunch break, so I hope we are all not too much starving. <laughs> May I quickly introduce myself? I'm the moderator of this session. My name is Agnes Tuna. I'm head of Kai Seed, the King Abdullah Dialogue Center's partnerships department within the programs. Uh, I'm dealing with collaborations and corporations in this newly uh, founded um, organization, which is based in Vienna, kind of a very young organization in its first years of existence. I'm also originally Viennese, so also a city which may be of interest in this session, also a very colorful city. I am self carrying a very old Turkish name, unfortunately not being able to speak in Turkish. It's the Turkish expression of Danube, the river in Vienna. So, so kind of a symbol of the mixtures and colorful living together in this city. Um, just very quick, I've been working before my um, appointment to Kaiseed as a special advisor to the Islamic religious community of Austria. And before, I've been working nearly five years in the Austrian Foreign Ministry, which has established in 2007 a specific task force exclusively dealing with the topic of interreligious and intercultural dialogue. So far to my background. Uh, first of all, let me very, very warmly express my, my, my gratefulness and thanks to the organizers of this conference, but also let me express a very warm thank you to our distinguished speakers of these panels. Some of them uh, have, had, have had a very long travel from abroad in sharing, your, in sharing their city experiences. So um, I'm really grateful that we are all now together going on a joint travel, starting in Toronto, going over to London City, and finally in Singapore, and if possible, in the time is allowing it us and also our stomachs in case we are not starving too long. Um, I would also happily share with you some experiences of, of the city of Vienna. Um, just for the regulations of this session, I would suggest um, that we first have the three presentations, one after the other, and if the time is again allowing it us, uh, I would like to open and welcome the audience um, for a quick one or two or even three questions uh, to the panelists. I, I would like that um, we also live the sense of dialogue and, and uh, have the great opportunity of these um, eminent guests to share uh, experiences and, and, and directly their experiences with you. So that would be my plan, so I hope it will be possible. Um, but just now get into directly into, the, um, into, our, into our topic and um, please uh, all together of us let us warmly welcome Ms. Usma Shak here. She's the director of the Equity, Diversity and Human Rights Office at the City of Toronto. Um, she has also been working as community-based researcher and advocate, and she can also be proud telling herself as an activist, so. <laughs> and has uh, served in the past as an executive director uh, in the Council of Agencies serving the South Asians, coming from Karachi, I guess, from Pakistan. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, we are very keen on your experiences. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to be in, um, in, 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 in Spain. Um, to come to Madrid to talk about diversity and equity, which is a passion of mine, is to die and go to heaven. <laughs> because I'm, I'm in one of the most historic cities. I'm in a country that has always fascinated me because as a Muslim, I feel I, we have something, we have a connection here, right? So I've read a lot about Spanish history, I've read a lot about Moorish history in Spain, and like I said, to be in Spain, I could die right now and I'm happy. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> he says, please don't. Um, I'll try, I'll try. So, um, 
Uh, and I apologize, I'm a much better speaker when I don't write, but the Canadian embassy would, you know, they'd get upset, so I wrote something. Um, so apologize if I read, and I'll read fast. Um, the ultimate aim of any democratic society is to build an equitable and just society. All societies are diverse, and the role of the state often has been to balance the rights of its diverse residents, and in times of conflict, to rely on certain fundamental legal or constitutional principles to negotiate and arbitrate those conflicts. It is important to recognize that Canada has never had either a state religion, formally, or a formal commitment to state secularism. Canada, I'm not talking Quebec, I'm talking Canada. Thus, as religious diversity poses both challenges and opportunities, Canadian policy approaches are still evolving, especially since we do not know whether adherence to different religious beliefs and values either facilitates or impedes the full participation of religious minorities in Canada. According to the Section 2 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, uh, religious freedom is recognized as a fundamental right. I thought you guys translate Spanish. <laughs> oh, they're like, damn right, yeah, yeah, yeah. They told me Spanish people speak so fast, you can speak any way you like. Um, <laughs> are you okay? All right, they're my friends. Uh, okay, so the Charter of Rights and Freedoms <laughs> recognizes um, religious rights as fundamental rights. But the Charter also entrenches multiculturalism in Article 27 as a defining attribute of the nation. And I'll quote you the Charter. It says, I quote, this Charter shall be interpreted in a manner consistent with the preservation and enhancement of the multicultural heritage of Canadians, not of multicultural minorities, but multicultural heritage of Canadians. So I guess, that's me as much as anybody else. Very important fact. Hence, religious pluralism is integral to the meaning of diversity in Canadian legislation. And this fact is reflected in Canadian history. Residential schools, which were religious schools run for Aboriginal children, not always with the best results, but nevertheless, we have publicly funded Catholic school boards, and we have aboriginal spiritual uh, you know, belief systems. I'll skip some of my text, okay? Others have suggested that, uh, so some people have suggested that religious uh, you know, diversity and religious discourse is part of political discourse in Canada, and it should be. Others have basically said, well, whether we like it or not, we are religiously diverse, so let's learn to live with it. According to, according to this argument, um, Canada is very, doing really well at the micro level. But at, a, at the level of public policy, we are muddling through. Like, we are not 100% sure, but we are doing our best. And the interesting thing is, we have no problems designing our programs to accommodate religious diversity. So if we design a program in which in our neighborhood, which is predominantly Muslim, we'll make sure that Muslim population is involved and engaged in a meaningful way. We have no problems with that because our program will be far more successful if those communities are involved, right? The problem arises when people want an exemption from state regulations. So for instance, there is the case in Ontario of a woman called N, her name is not disclosed, who brought charges against her uncle and uh, cousins um, for sexual assault, a Muslim woman, and she wanted to give testimony against them wearing a naqab. Now there she's asking for an exemption because in the criminal system, the defense has a right to see the person who's accusing them. And here is a woman who's courageous enough to accuse her own family members for sexual assault. You know, I would have thought a bastion of uh, feminism. But on the other hand, she's asking for accommodation and she's saying, I want to testify, but from behind a niqab. That's where, ooh, the state doesn't know quite how to deal with it. 
And Canada has adopted a case-by-case -case approach. The lower court rejected her request and said, no, she has to give testimony without the naqab. She appealed, and the higher court said, no, she has a right to protection under the charter. So what the higher court said was that the judge will have to balance her right of religious protection and the defendant's rights to be able to see their accusers. Uh, the case is still going on, so I can't tell you what happened. Um, so you'll just have to hold your breath. Um, <laughs> research shows that there is no appetite amongst policymakers to adopt a distinct policy lens for dealing with religious pluralism, because in Canada, we are already using cultural lens. We are already using a diversity lens. We are already using an equity lens. So policy makers are not interested in developing a religious lens, because they think religion is part and parcel of culture, of diversity, and of equity. So of course, the, this means that there is a lot, long, you know, wide variety of differences amongst policymakers. Um, however, at the city of Toronto, we have a long history of access, equity, and diversity work. City has always erred or made a mistake on the side of inclusion. The city's position has not just been that you ask for accommodation and I will accommodate you. It's been, no, I will consider your needs before you need to ask me. If, if I fail, okay, you can ask. But I will think about your difference before you need to ask me. And I think that's very important for the city of Toronto. We have to deal with pluralism at all levels, demographic, ethnic, racial, linguistic, socioeconomic, religious, etc. However, in my experience in the city, diversity has not been a major problem, particularly religious diversity. And this fact could have various reasons. One, Canada has history of diversity, including religious diversity, which predates colonial, um, you know, um, arrival of uh, colonial, um, Western colonial forces. Aboriginal people were always diverse. They are different nations, different cultures, different languages, different spiritual beliefs. Then English and French have different religions, different cultures, different languages. And then all of us showed up after 1960s, um, and we have our differences. So Canada has always had a history of diversity. It's nothing new. That's why, as uh, Mr. Bouchard said, in, in multiculturalism, there is no majority and there is no minority because we've been diverse for a very long time. So the, the other thing is that the national narrative of Canada is that of a settler nation, where immigration and diversity have always been part of nation building. Thirdly, in the 1960s, fourthly, right? thirdly, in the 1960s, Canada introduced um, um, the point system for selection of immigrants, which is important. And then the and lastly, Canadian law and public policy acknowledges diversity, both in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, official bilingualism, multiculturalism act, and federal and provincial human rights codes. All of them recognize diversity, including religious diversity, as a fundamental value of Canada. Therefore, in my personal and professional experience, immigration, immigrants as a political and social, uh, you know, uh, uh, immigration as a process is not just a transnational movement of people, but also connections and bonds. Just because I came to Canada doesn't mean I ceased to be a Pakistani. My mother lives in Pakistan. When something happens in Pakistan, it matters to me. And I've been living in Canada for 25 years. I've lived longer in Canada than I've lived in Pakistan. But I don't cease to exist as a Pakistani because now I'm a Canadian. And I don't have to. That's the beauty of Canada. I don't have to give up my heritage in order to be a Canadian. And I think that is important because my level of my sense of belonging to Canada is based on that duality. That's mine, but that's not a problem. At the city of Toronto, policy practitioners have acknowledged that the state, in order to retain its neutrality, cannot assimilate diverse people, but rather it must create the conditions for diverse populations to retain aspects of their diversity, 
but also negotiate and internalize a new social reality. So at the municipal level, we, what we do is, when in doubt, your policy decision must be consistent with our obligations, which come from legislation, which is primarily the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the Ontario, Charter, uh, Ontario Code of um, uh, hum, uh, Human Rights Code. Secondly, in times of conflict, the inner logic of our policy frameworks must be maintained, which is to build an equitable, just, and a diverse society. It's not good enough to be diverse. You know, if you and I are diverse, that sounds like what I call sari and samosa syndrome. You know, you can wear your sari, you can eat your samosa, you can do your little song and dance. That's not what Canada is talking about. Diversity means justice for everyone and equality for everyone. But equality with the understanding that we may not all be equal, so maybe equity is better. And I will show you a representation of it. In terms of Toronto's diversity, here is a little bit of it, and I don't know. Um, one in three immigrants are newcomers, 49% visible minorities, 100 faith groups, 230 ethnic origins, 51% foreign-born. These are the languages that are spoken in Toronto. Chinese, Italian, Portuguese, Polish, Spanish, Punjabi, Tagalog, Tamil, German, Greek, Arabic, and I won't even go into the others. Religious pluralism in Canada, as you can see the breakdown. However, when you look at religion, religious pluralism in Toronto, you see that the Muslims, 54% Christians, 8% Muslims, and growing. Now, that could be positive or dangerous, as it depends on how you look at it. 6% Hindus, 1% Sikhs, 3% Buddhist, 4% Jewish, and 24% no religious affiliation. Uh, sorry. So, um, this is the level of diversity in terms of religious pluralism. In terms of mother tongue, non-official languages are 45% and English is 51%. In terms of language spoken at home, English is much larger, but that's because of the second generation and the third generation of immigrants. My kids, their mother tongue originally may have been Urdu, but they speak English and French. At home, they speak English. So that's why you see that English is more predominant language, even though there are other mother, mother tongues. Now, the, I wanted to show you this. This is what City of Toronto has adopted for its principle. You want to be equal, you do what's on the left. That's how you treat people equally. The problem is the little guy doesn't get to feel like he's being treated very well. Of course, if he's watching a Toronto Blue Jays game, it's probably good for him not to watch it. We always lose. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, but you see what I'm saying. We are treating everyone equally here. But the problem is they were never equal to start off with. So what we have chosen to do is equity, which is that you look at the, uh, the fact that people are not equal and then treat them in an equitable way so that their outcome is equitable. Not that they, you treat them equally, but that you treat them in a way that when they, at the end of the day, they all feel they had the same equal experience. Very important. Um, I will skip over certain things, but religious pluralism, in my experience, is an issue that has begun to emerge for the city of Toronto in terms of accommodation. Employee accommodation, but also service accommodation. The premise of all city policies is based on two fundamental principles. One is what uh, Monsieur Bouchard also talked about, undue hardship, and the other is duty to accommodate. First and foremost, all policymakers at the city of Toronto have a duty to accommodate, which means that we must rely on the grounds that are protected under the Human Rights Code, which are you cannot discriminate against any person on the basis of race, ancestry, place of origin, color, ethnic origin, citizenship, creed, sex, 
sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, age, record of offenses, marital status, family status, or disability. Basically, it means don't discriminate. Because by the time you're through with all these grounds, there's nothing much left to discriminate on, right? So you see what I'm saying? The duty to accommodate. The only time when you can say, I cannot accommodate, is if you can show that the cost of accommodation is so high that the city of Toronto will go bankrupt. Needless to say, it's a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult to say that the city of Toronto will go bankrupt if I were to accommodate a Muslim woman who wants her services to be delivered after iftar. You know what I'm saying? It's a bit difficult. The point being, don't discriminate. And so that's the principle that we follow. The city of Toronto has an accommodation policy that includes sections on creed and religion, religious observance, De dress code, break policies, flexible scheduling, and my office is right now involved in developing a service accommodation policy. And some of the examples of accommodation, during Ramadan, for instance, we ask all divisions at the city of Toronto to deal, uh, to, to, to accommodate Muslim workers, particularly who have to do physical labor. We also ask them to give them prayer breaks, to provide alternative duties during really hot days, because if they are fasting, it's not good enough to say, tell them, go and work in the yard when they could faint. Uh, change the work hours if necessary, have access to prayer rooms, etc. We've produced a guide for supervisors and managers on accommodating employees during Ramadan. We've produced a guide on Kirpan. Um, I don't know if you know what a kirpan is. Kirpan is that little dagger that uh, Sikhs, uh, you know, conservative Sikhs wear as a fundamental symbol of their uh, faith. It, no, it's not a weapon, although it looks like one. So we have actually produced an accommodation policy on it. City provides non-denominational prayer rooms in all its facilities. City has in initiated special programs, for example, in neighborhoods where there's a large Muslim population, the staff noticed all the women were not coming to the uh, swimming classes. Nobody asked them, and the staff is like, this is bad for women, it's good for their health to learn to swim, etc." but they were not coming. So they decided to hold one day as all female classes. All other classes are joy, you know, just regular classes for everyone, but one day a week, the classes are dedicated just for females. And I will tell you, it's not just the Muslim women who are using those classes. Other women are using it. Women like me. I'm a Muslim, but I use it because I'm uncomfortable about my body. You know, I don't want to wear a swimsuit in public, right? Maybe somebody feels more comfortable because they don't want to be in the public eye. I don't know. But a lot of women are using those classes. Um, city clerk um, office that schedules all council meetings of all the councillors, the politicians. They do not hold any council meetings and committees on high holy days, whether they are Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. Most city divisions used a multi-faith calendar to schedule the important uh, public consultations. They make sure that they don't hold it on a day where either the Christians or Jews or Hindus or Muslims or Buddhists cannot attend. City, my division has developed an equity lens, which, we are, which includes all kinds of dimensions of diversity. We are what we are saying to staff, use it before you develop a policy, before you develop a program. And of course, the city has an anti-harassment uh, anti harassment slash discrimination policy. So if, you, if anybody at the city who's working at the city thinks, no, I want to discriminate, well, we have a policy that tells you you can't, just in case you didn't want to do it all on your own. Um, now, that doesn't mean we haven't had conflicts. Now, you're thinking, oh, she's making it sound like Toronto is such a good place. Um, and I know Toronto has its problems. Absolutely, we have our problems. But you know what? They come from very strange places. 
I was telling someone, by now everyone hates me equally, so I must be doing something right. Um, but we had, an, uh, we had an incident where the city of Toronto gave money to a women's organization in a neighborhood which is suffering from socioeconomic hardships. So they gave them money to paint a mural over a whole block of buildings, you know, to encourage tourism and, you know, attraction and all of those things. It's called street art program. So the, a painter, you know, the community held 13 consultations. They came up, agree, agreed that this is what they want on their mural, et cetera, et cetera. One piece of that mural was uh, commissioned to a young Muslim artist who was born in Canada uh, to put something inspiring. So he chose a calligraphy, which you know what calligraphy is. I mean, it's a piece from the Quran, right? Some phrase from the Quran. Unfortunately, he chose a phrase which he thought was inspiring but turned out to be a controversial one in which it says, um, if you struggle in the name of God, you will succeed. He thought it was inspirational, that people who live there will get an inspirational message from it, that if I struggle in the name of God, whichever your God may be, you will succeed. Well, everybody was very happy. It was a landmark in the city of Toronto until one day, somebody happened to be walking by, another Muslim, looked at it, didn't like it, and sent a letter to our mayor and all city councillors saying, oh my God, the city is funding jihadi lovers. And we are like, oh, why? And he's like, oh, because this is uh, the calligraphy. This calligraphy is saying, if you struggle in the name of religion, you will succeed. It's the rallying call for Taliban in Syria. So of course, uh, you know, people at the city of Toronto got really hysterical and they're like, oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? So they came to our office and uh, so we t said, okay, let's get an opinion, a, a, a scholarly opinion. There's no point in asking an imam because two imams could also differ. So let's just get a scholarly opinion. We went to a lawyer who works, who teaches at the University of Toronto Law School. He's an expert on um, medieval Islamic law. And he gave his opinion and he said, here is what this, uh, you know, this calligraphy is, this is where it is in the Quran, this is what the context is. And as far as I'm concerned, street art is, de is, demo is democratic by nature. So are you asking me if a militant is walking by, they'll see this as a call for jihad? Maybe. If a person who's living in socioeconomic hardship walks by and sees this as inspirational, maybe. It depends. You know, when you go and see El, you know, Greco's painting, maybe you see something I don't see, right? So that he basically said he couldn't understand what the problem was. Then we asked the artist. The artist said, well, I'm a Canadian born. I know nothing about Taliban. All I know is that I thought this was inspirational. We asked the women's organization, why did you do this? And they're like, are you kidding me? How dare you tell us that we are uh, militants? We are militant feminists. We are not militant um, Islamists. Okay. So then we decided that we, we responded to this gentleman and we said we will not do anything. We got a legal opinion from our own city solicitor's office and we said we were not going to do anything because unless you can show that it violates the charter or the criminal code, we are not going to do anything. And that was the end of it. And of course, he got really upset and he wrote articles in the newspaper telling us how the office has been taken over by jihadi lovers, how I am a Muslim fundamentalist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know what? City of Toronto took a position. And for better or for worse, that's what we did. Similarly, we had an incident where there were cab drivers who were being trained um, in, in, in a, a city facility because the city of Toronto licensing, uh, lic licenses uh, taxis. And most of them happened to be Muslims and they were using the prayer room and they were putting out their prayer mats and leaving them there. Because you know how Muslims have to go three, four times a day. So, you know, it was impractical and nobody else was using the prayer room. And then some of them started bring the, the bringing their Quran and leaving them around. Some of them brought calligraphy and put it on the walls. Well, one day someone came and took a video and put it on YouTube and said, oh my God, city of Toronto facility is turning into a mosque. 
So they came to us, and they're like, what should we do? And we're like, tell them to take down the calligraphy, remove the Qurans, and fold up their prayer mats. This is not a mosque. This is a prayer room. And they're like, yeah, but nobody else is using it. We're like, it doesn't matter. It is, it is just, it doesn't matter. It's a prayer room. It's a non-denominational prayer room. And yes, it's inconvenient for Muslims, but so be it. Unfortunately, nobody came and said that I was a freedom lover or a charter lover. They always come when I do something negative against them. Um, so that was another incident that we dealt with. Um, I will basically give you my personal reflections. I think I may be running out of time very fast. Um, in terms of my personal experience, Canada is still an experiment in the making. And it has always been diverse. So we need to negotiate our differences through legislative frameworks. And in my case, uh, the, uh, at the city of Toronto, the framework that we rely on is the Charter of Rights and Freedom, which is the highest law of the land, and the Human Rights Code of Ontario, and the Criminal Code. But more importantly, we have to make sure that our policy is not just consistent with legislation, but also with the internal logic of that legislation, which is based on Canadian foundational values, which are, as I said at the beginning, equity, diversity, and justice. Very important that we be just. And that's a bottom line for public policy. Secondly, if Canada is not just diverse, but also unequal, I mean, there are people who are unequal in terms of income, in terms of um, you know, marginality of other kinds, then we policymakers must put public back in public policy and focus on differential treatment, equity and equality. This is called differential treatment for equitable outcomes. It doesn't mean treating people differently to be unequal. It means treating people differently to produce equitable, you know, equity of outcome. I also believe that public policy, in order to be meaningful, must create economic political participation, civic engagement, and education on each other's rights. However, we must remain cautious of one very critical fact of current reality. It is a fact of life whether you like it or not. There are two things happening, happening simultaneously in our societies. On one side, religion is playing an increasingly explicit role in personal and public and social life of some people. But at the same time, the reaction to this expression of, relig of religious preference is equally explicit. Irony is that both sides are quite willing to say the other is completely wrong to prove that they are right. As a policy practitioner, I believe we need to understand that the state needs to be careful not to fall into this logic, where we convince ourselves that we are doing something for a higher good, as if we are somehow up here over our people. Government is the people. We are as much part of this debate as anybody else. And we muddle through just like anybody else. But we need to be careful that we don't start thinking because we are policymakers, we know better. Because that's when resentment sets in, that's when radicalization sets in, and that's when people start to push back and say, no, I live in a democratic society, I elect you, who are you to tell me what I should think, right? So I think it's important as policymakers to be aware of that. One other thing, I believe that we need government programs to change the narrative of religious pluralism, religious versus secular pluralism, from one where one group or the other, and this could be the state as well, claims to have the ultimate access to truth and justice. We need to move away. I'm religious, I know what truth is. I'm secularist, I know what truth is. I think we need to change the narrative. We need to move away from that to a narrative where we develop mechanisms in society to build a shared social purpose. We are living in Toronto together. Come hail or shine, we either sink together or we swim together. So it's better to have dialogue where we share our understanding of what it means to swim together. We also need to be aware that prejudice and racism are alive and thriving 
And sometimes secular versus religious debate becomes a proxy for xenophobia. And we as policymakers need to be very vigilant that we don't end up reproducing the ethno-racial other. And I thought it was very interesting that of, uh, of that institute, uh, Kaid, that they actually have a program on looking at the ethnic other. Just because we think their values are different from us or that of majority. Ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, religious pluralism, just like any other dimension of diversity, requires negotiation and a balancing of demands. But we cannot do it if we continue to see some of our citizens as children of a lesser God. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, dear Usma, for this and very enriching and, if I may say so, even entertaining and vivid <laughs> lecture. <laughs> and also thank you very much for highlighting, first of all, the differences between the Canadian and the Quebec context that we had this morning. I think this is also very important to see on these different levels. And, of course, for reminding us all that cities have responsibility. They have the responsibility to create the conditions, not only for diversity, but also for equity. Mm -hmm. And this difference in these notions and in these words is really important. Thank you very much again. Thank you. So uh, let's rush to our next speaker, Mr. David Wood, Senior Community Relations Officer at the Greater London Authority. So please travel us to London City. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to all the organizers for this wonderful event. It really is an honor uh, for me to be here. My name is David Wood and I lead on faith community engagement for the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. And I personally speak as the son of a Church of England bishop, so be, be gentle with me for that. Um, <laughs> what I'm, um, firstly I have to say, ask your forgiveness, being from the UK, I can only speak the Queen's English. So, um, thanks, so my thanks to the translators for helping me get my message across today. I apologize for that. It's a curse of being British, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> yes. um, I, I'm going to try to be quick because I know that time is always an issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give some background about the Mayor and the Greater London Authority, uh, some information on diversity in London, particularly religious diversity. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we recognise and build relationships um, and also talk about issues raised with us by religious groups and how we respond to them. Um, okay. So, um, firstly, some information about the mayor. Um, the mayor of the office of the mayor of London was created in 2000, so it's a relatively new um, creation. And his remit is to ensure the social, economic, and cultural well-being of London, uh, and to celebrate London's diversity. So this is enshrined in the Greater London Authority Act. So he has a duty to promote those things, and that includes promoting uh, religious diversity and community cohesion. Um, he has a broad range of powers, uh, including transport, fire, fire and emergency planning, uh, economic development planning, housing planning, and the environment. And the Greater London Authority is a slightly complicated structure in that it has the mayor's office, and the mayor is obviously the executive power, and it also has the London Assembly, whose job it is to scrutinize the mayor and what he does. But they're all enshrined in the Greater London Authority, and I am an officer of the Greater London Authority. So although a lot of my work is for the mayor, strictly speaking, I'm this part of the secretariat, the civil service, if you will. Um, so, London, um, we like to use the tag, um, the world in one city, um, reason being that we consider ourselves to be, and I think we are just about the most diverse city in the, diverse large city in the world, um, ahead of New York even, and our population is now uh, 8 million, 8 million 170,000. Now, 40% of uh, London's population is classed as being from minority ethnic communi communities. And the proportion of non-UK born residents in London rose from 27% 27 in 2001 to, 30, to 38% in 2011. So that equates to 1,720,000 uh, Londoners. Um, of those, of the non of those London residents who were not born in the UK, 
Uh, the majority, sorry, the, the most are from, the, from Poland, and they're 156,000, followed by Ireland, and then uh, people with Indian passports. That's 123,000. Now, um, there are 42,000 Spanish passport holders in London, and that's the 12th largest of all, of all, the, of all Londoners, of, from uh, people born outside of London. Um, right. In terms of religion in London, we have, what we've done is, we have the, our 10-year census, and from 2001, we asked a, an optional question on religious affiliation. So we never had it before then. Um, and we, so that was added in 2001 and continued in 2011. Um, now, in our last census, um, seven and a half million Londoners uh, answered the optional question on uh, religious affiliation, which is quite a lot, I believe that's 91%. Um, now, of those, 23% of those said that they were of no religion. That means that nearly six million Londoners consider themselves to be religious in some way. Uh, of those, 48% are, are Christian. Um, one, uh, just over a million, which constitutes 12%, are Muslim. Uh, just over 411,000, or 5%, are Hindu. 1.8%, uh, or just under 150,000, are Jewish. And 126,000, um, 1.5%, are Sikh. Um, now, there is a slight, there is an issue about the Jewish, uh, Jewish figure in the sense that there are historical uh, concerns about under-enumeration because, particularly in the Orthodox Haredi community, there are issues about... Um, giving information and various other things that we try to work around. So we know that the, it's in all likelihood an undercount. Now in terms of the mayor's view on religion, he, has a, he, he considers himself to be, he says it, his, his view of religion and God, it flickers. It's like trying to drive through the British countryside and trying to listen to the, to the FM radio. Sometimes it, it flickers in and it flickers out the further you go from the big cities. That's how he sees his view of religion. Um, but what he, did, what he does say is it was only recently that he became convinced that there is actually a God. When uh, we had a situation where a secular group wanted to put advertisements on the buses on transport system saying that there is no God and you know, everyone should just get on and enjoy their lives without worrying about what God might think. Now, within hours of those advertisements going on the buses, we had the most horrendous snowfall that we'd seen in, in hundreds of years in London, brought the whole city to a crippling halt, including the buses, which then couldn't get out of the garages to put this message from the secular group that there is no God. So that convinced the mayor that actually there, is, <laughs> there actually is a higher power that's working and he had to take heed of it. Uh, <laughs> right, um, okay, so. In terms of our approach, I've touched on, we have, so from those figures, you would have seen that we have, you know, incredible diversity in London. So what we do is not to try and manage religious diversity as such. Um, to our mind, it does a pretty good job of organizing itself um, fairly harmoniously for the most part. I mean, we have the legal framework to protect minorities. So, um, so ours is much more about practical interaction at community level and what we can do to make those relationships a little bit better. Now, for every mayoral initiative or, pro pro or proposal or policy, he has to um, give consideration to the equality issues impact. We have to do what's called an equality Im impact assessment form, which also which factors in how that particular policy will affect different communities. Excuse me. And that incorporates uh, religious groups. So in other words, it's an attempt to enshrine within all the work that we do, uh, as Uma said, that we sort of, we are already planning for it. We don't have to react to things. We actually factor those considerations into what we do. And we think that that works pretty well for the most part. Um, what we do try and do, however, is to educate all Londoners about our multitude of faiths. And what we, and within that, so that's understanding why different communities might uh, have different things that they have to factor in, even though it might be considered the usual practice of the majority of, of Londoners. And to do that, so um, as part of that, we make a point though of always emphasizing that which unites us. 
So we talk about the things that we share, whilst also making sure that we learn about and respect the differences. And from that, we think it has engendered a good sense of community relations and community cohesion. So one of the things that the mayor will always do is to make a point of celebrating all the major faith festivals in a very public way in Trafalgar Square, which for those of you who know London is sort of the most iconic, central point in London. So we have the festival, we have uh, celebrations for Eid, Diwali, Vasaki, Hanukkah, um, all those things, Christmas carol, uh, carols on the square. And there's a very important point there because what we are trying to say is that we're saying that London's government values you. We're saying that you're free to be whomsoever you are and to celebrate uh, as you see fit. But you are part of London. You are Londoners and you're part of our rich tapestry. And this is our attempt to make sure that you know that we recognize what you bring to our city and we want to join with you and celebrate and open it to all Londoners. And so those events in Trafalgar Square where we get upwards of around 10,000 people, there will be a majority from the particular faith, but you will always get a large number of Londoners or visitors to London who just come along. It's open to everyone to see what's going on and to learn about different faiths. And, well, and that's, how, that's one, one of our ways in which we um, try, seek to make sure that those, measure, those, me, those messages get across very, very strongly because this is what London is and what London is about. Um, so how do we measure our success? Um, this is, can be quite a difficult one, but in various ways. Um, so we do the usual things. We always, we have a, an annual London survey, or have done until recently, um, where we ask Londoners about living in London, what they consider to be the best things, what do they like most about living in London. Always at the top of those, uh, of those, um, of those surveys are, um, it's diversity. It's the fact that, you know, there are so many things going on, so many different communities who get on very well. Those are the things that people like most of all. It's not the London weather, which is very strange. I don't know why that is. It's those things that people value most. Um, one of the things we also have, um, we also recently had, and I have to apologize to anybody here who is from Madrid, the uh, 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, which was seen as a very much a successful event, not least because from the very outset, from the bid in 2004, right through to the delivery in 2012, was the fact that at every level we factored in the religious communities, we thought about the different equality groups, we worked with the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and the Gujaras to say, right, you are all part of this too. We want to be able to say to the world, when you come to London, you are coming, you will find people like you, you will come, you are coming home. There are always communities who will welcome you and that's what we made sure we did, so that as part of the visitor sort of um, package, we included information about where um, communities could go to worship or to, to have those certain um, religious um, considerations. And we think that worked very, very well. Now, um, that's not to say there haven't been challenges. And one of our major challenges was in 2005. Uh, when on July 7 we had um, bombings on the London Underground network, the, the Metro. And that created some, as you, as, um, because they were, uh, that created some real problems because of, um, for, for reasons that I don't really need to, to go into. Um, so what we, what we did, and we were very clear on doing um, when those things happened, was we wanted to get a message across very, very carefully that we could not be divided by those incidents. So what we did from straight away, we, need, we knew we needed to prevent a backlash because if that happened, the impact would be horrendous for London as a city moving forward where we all try to, uh, as best as we can, to work together and live together and do what we can. So from the outset, we created a, a campaign which was called One London, Seven Million Londoners. So what we did was we put up banners all across London, you know, hanging from the lamppost and the street lights and all the rest of it to get that message across, across the whole of London. We um, put out, took out advertisements in the press to keep hammering that message across to say, this will not divide us, we, we will reign together. We brought together all the leaders of the faith communities and we had a big event in Trafalgar Square. We had them all hold hands and embrace and, and 
put that message across to make sure that nobody would get in the way of what we were trying to do. That seemed to, that worked very well in the sense that we saw very little, a very tiny spike in incidents of religious hatred or crimes against different communities. And we put a lot of that down to the work that we had done to build on what already existed in London in the sense of our community cohesion. Um, we had, a, and similarly, when we had an awful attack in Woolwich, uh, South London last year, an, uh, an attack on a soldier. And similarly, again, we were very concerned about the backlash, that the attack was such that it was of such a heinous crime that we, we knew we'd have some problems. Um, similarly, we, we were lucky in that we, um, we managed to minimize um, as any sort of incidents or of, act of religious hatred um, attacks on communities, although what we did see is a spike in social media uh, abuse, things like Twitter and Facebook and things like that. There, were, there was a slight spike in sort of uh, Islamophobic um, posts and that sort of thing. But in terms of actual attacks, we saw physical attacks, we saw very few, and we had, I think, one attack on a mosque in London, which um, appeared to be in an isolated incident. So those are the sorts of things that we would look at as trig potential triggers for, you know, for, for you know, uh, creating um, a situation of, um, thank you, of, um, of problems. And we've managed to avoid many of those. I've got to speed up. Um, so what I would do, oh, and we, one, one thing that we, I must flag up is the fact that we, um, when we had, what we do have now is informal networks of groups of faith communities who organized to work together themselves. When we had riots in 2011, we totally, without reference to anybody else, we had our Sikh community in West London who organized groups to go and protect the local mosque because they knew, they, sorry, they were concerned that that would be a, a focus for attack. And they did that irrespective of what we were doing or anyone else did. They did it themselves. And I think that's a measure of the sorts of cohesion that we've been able to, to build. Um, right, so. Um, in terms of building, uh, continue, building on success or continuous engagement, we will always look to weave faith communities into the fabric of mayoral policies so that whatever um, we're doing, we know that that can, can, can call on the support of faith communities. Um, for example, very briefly, in terms of our emergency planning, if we have an incident, we know who to speak to in the communities to make sure the right messages get across. Well, that's really important to us. We always, we always looked for opportunities to bring people together and bring communities together in, in various ways, and that's kind of the way we approach. We, all, we always make sure we have a continuous engagement so we're able to respond to concerns and act where necessary. We had, in, in, uh, a few years ago, we had the Jewish community who wanted to create a, what's called an Erev, which is a sort of a designated bound area where within that within that space uh, Jewish community could go about and perform certain tasks and things that they wouldn't be able to do on the Sabbath which um, if you didn't have those the demarcation the mayor intervened with the different boroughs used uh, transport his transport for London land to mark the boundaries so that the Jewish community the Orthodox Haredi community were able to do lots of things they wouldn't have been able to do without that official uh, demarcation um, right um, okay I'm going to speed on um, so that's part of what we do and we always always aware that in terms of responding to needs the mayor is a safe place for many when we have interface faith issues or concerns. In other words, if the mayor is involved, we know that, and the faith communities know that it is, a, as, as, as I say, a safe place where they can come and where there will be no kind of majority view where they will be forced to go along with or the, with things that they might not necessarily agree with or any intra-faith community tensions will not be there because the mayor is seen as a safe sort of arbiter and they can come to us in, in, um, you know, in, with, a, with that feeling. Um, right, uh, some of the issues that we also, we often have to deal with um, around funding and planning, how suitable housing for faith communities, what we do is to engage with the communities directly. Um, we can't fund things directly. We can also, we can only fund those activities which are specific mayoral policies. We can't just, we can't give uh, funds or grants to um, say the Muslim, uh, Muslim Council of Britain, for example, um, because we're not allowed to do that. But if the Muslim Council of Britain wants to do something around the uh, mayoral policy, like encouraging more volunteers or citizenship, then we can give funding. It's a slightly different model to maybe some of the other uh, cities. Um, in terms of looking forward, we're very, very, very clear that faith communities are vital to our 
social and economic future. And our job in the mayoralty is to create those conditions for faith groups to do what they're doing and to thrive and to flourish because our future is bound up in, in, in the communities and, the, and us working together. So our line is always that we celebrate diversity as a strength to be preserved and protected because our vision of London is very much as a city where people are free to be who they want to be. As long as it doesn't affect the rights or the responsibilities of other people, then whatever you do is fine with us. And as long as you sort of stick with that in mind, uh, what we find is faith communities appreciate that because they know that, that, because they don't want to impact on other people. They just want to be free to do what they do. And that's very much what we seek to encourage. We're not without challenges, as Professor Bouchard said this morning. In the UK, we are, are under pressure because of the sort of austerity and the cuts to public services. And that creates certain tensions in terms of how people view different communities and particularly new immigration into London. But for the most part, we've been able to maintain that despite those challenges. And so um, I think I'll wrap up there and say um, thank you very much for having me. I hope that gives a brief flavor of what London has been about. And I'm um, happy to ask questions or, um, or, or to um, provide any information if you, want, if you want to catch me outside to talk about it some more. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it was really interesting, in, in especially in finding out that there are also other systems working, like self-organization, and not this notion of managing the religious diversity. And also this idea of a unity of people living in a city was also kind of, in hard times, a really attracting idea. Um, but let's now um, welcome Mr. Imrat Mohamed Taib uh, from Singapore. He's uh, since 2006 um, active as a senior program consultant to the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, the MUIS Academy. Also an interfaith activist and um, postgraduate student at the Department of Malay Studies from the Uni National University of Singapore. Please give him a warm welcome. It's your floor, Imran. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference and to your beautiful country, which is the first time I'm here. It's a nice break from 365 days of summer in my country. Uh, in case you find uh, it's a bit too cold here, you're always welcome to come to my country for some brief summer. Um, although I work for the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, my presentation is not so much focusing on what the council do, uh, but rather to provide some context to the management of religious diversity in Singapore. Uh, unlike Toronto or London, uh, Singapore is not just a city, but it's actually also a nation state in itself. So it's a city state. And therefore, uh, I'm also going to discuss a bit on state policies dealing with religious diversity. Um, it's, uh, Singapore, it's about 5.3 million and growing population, uh, with almost half of it comprised of permanent residents or naturalized new citizens. Uh, ever since the early beginnings as a British colony and later uh, its independence in 1965, Singapore society has always been diverse and constitute what uh, the British colonial historian Furnival said uh, or described as a plural society, uh, i.e. a society comprising of distinct and separate ethnic groups meeting only in the marketplace. Uh, today, uh, nothing much has changed from that, uh, although the distribution of the different ethnic groups have, have somewhat changed ever since independence, where the Chinese uh, ethnic community comprise of uh, about 74.2% of the total population. The Malays, which I belong to, uh, uh, has an ethnic category, uh, and also as an indigenous group uh, at 13.2%, and the Indians at 9.2%. In terms of religious uh, 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 diversity, the majority subscribe to either Buddhism, uh, Taoism, or traditional Chinese religions. Uh, Christianity has also seen a significant growth uh, in numbers, uh, particularly during the last few decades amongst the Chinese. Uh, uh, while uh, the Malays are largely homogeneously uh, Muslims, uh, and the Indians are mostly Hindus, with a small percentage of Muslims. Uh, Singapore recognizes 10 uh, uh, religious groups, uh, which includes Baha'ism, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, etc. And freedom of religion is accorded to all, according to the Article 3 of the Singapore Constitution, 
but several religious groups uh, deem as a threat to national security and interests such as the Jehovah's Witness because they refuse to uh, sing the national anthem and uh, salute the state flag uh, outrightly banned. Uh, in recent times, we have seen a significant growth of people who declare themselves also as atheists uh, or those who subscribe to no religion at all. Uh, they constitute about one-fifth of the population now. Now, an observation to note is that the highly open uh, economy like Singapore with a significant liberal immigration policy will further di diversify the demography with not only diversity across religions, but also internal diversity or intra-religion. A case in point is the Muslim community in Singapore who were once homogeneously Sunni and subscribed to the Shafi'i school of thought, uh, but now with migrant Muslims coming in particularly from, from the Indian subcontinent, uh, belonging to other schools of thought such as uh, Hanafi, uh, will significantly create a, a bit of impact uh, in terms of intra-diversity. Uh, Christianity too has seen a more diversified growth, with Singapore actually being home to one of the largest evangelical communities outside of America, and often posing a challenge to traditional mainline churches that are in existence in Singapore. Now, all of this would mean that state policies dealing with religious diversity cannot be static, but has to evolve over the changing landscape of uh, Singapore society in general. And I will outline several aspects of these changing policies. Uh, but first, we need to note that Singapore at its inception as an independent nation regards itself as multicultural and also secular, in the sense that uh, it accepts diversity as something that is natural, and that the state will remain neutral, particularly with regards to religion. But that does not mean that the state adopts a laissez-faire approach to religion. In fact, religion and also race or ethnicity remains heavily controlled and managed. Both religion and race remains two aspects of Singapore society that constitute what is called the OB marker. OB here meaning out of bound marker. Uh, items that are not subjected to be debated or discussed publicly and constitute what the government often portrayed as deep fault lines that can tear Singapore social fabric apart if not regulated or managed. Thus, it is rare to find contentious issues in race or religion being debated in government-controlled state media or within the underdeveloped civil society movements. The state narrative for the need to keep religion away from public discussion is based primarily on the founding myths of Singapore society. Racial and religious riots that occur in early Singapore history particularly the Maria Hertog riot in 1950. This is over uh, custody of a child uh, who was born to a Dutch uh, Christian parents and then uh, adopted by Muslim parents uh, uh, that caused a, a riot in 1950. And the Prophet Muhammad's birthday riot in 1964 where uh, the Maulid Nabi uh, procession was being attacked and there was uh, 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 racial and religious tensions. In addition, the independence of Singapore, which was essentially a separation of Singapore from its motherland, Malaysia, after a brief period of three years, was within the backdrop of racial politics and tensions, particularly between the Chinese and the Malay community, which is typical of many uh, colonized uh, societies. Little wonder then that Islam, which was often conflated with the ethnic category of Malay, remains the only religion that is directly and officially managed by the state given that Singapore sees itself has uh, a little red dot in a sea of green. Uh, green here meaning surrounded by Muslim-majority states like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. Upon independence, a law was enacted called the uh, AMLA, or Administration of Muslim Law Act, which allows for the establishment of uh, Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, or Majlis Ugama Islam Singapura Mu'is, that's where I work, that is responsible to manage all things related to Islamic affairs, including the collection of zakat, the religious tithe, uh, hajj, pilgrimage, uh, mosques and madrasas, and any other matters relating to Islamic affairs. The president, of, or currently the chief executive officer of Mu'is, is appointed uh, directly by the cabinet, including the mufti, who remains a state functionary. Uh, Mu'is is directly governed under the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth and Islam is the only religion with an official portfolio of having a minister in charge of Muslim affairs. Now, despite the state's uh, wary attitude towards religion and thus a need to control it, it was generally positive towards the potential of ro role of religion as collaborator in the nation-building process. We can see this from the period of the 1960s up to the 70s, where emerging from two governmental reports, uh, which are known as the Go Keng Sui report in 1967 and the Ong Teng Cheong report in 1979, 
religion was seen as a uh, bulwark against the perceived threat of communism and the perceived decadence and immorality of the West. Both a narrative employed to bolster also the ruling party's own turn towards what probably some of you might have heard, Asian values, which essentially means a form of governance that emphasizes obedience to authority and doing away with either progressive politics of the left or the liberal democracy of capitalist societies. Now, as a result of the two reports, religious knowledge uh, was instituted in 1984 as a compulsory subject in all government schools. Each student will attend religious knowledge classes according to his or her own religion. Uh, but the period of the 1980s also uh, is a period of religious revivalism in, 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 in not just in Southeast Asia, but also globally as well. In particular, we know, for example, the Christian right movement that began in America began to influence the development of Christianity in Singapore. And Singapore saw a phenomenal growth of charismatic and evangelical churches from the 1980s onward. At the same time, as a result of many things that goes on in the Muslim world, including the Iranian Revolution in 1979 and a host of other factors, the Muslim world took a turn also towards an activist mode of calling for a return to Islam or Islam as a solution to the world's problem, which essentially meant a call for the establishment of an Islamic state and the institution of a particular interpretation of what is known as uh, Sharia law. Uh, we saw, for example, the mushrooming of Muslim-owned uh, 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 evangelical groups uh, known as the Dawah groups that links itself to transnational movements like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or to the ideas of uh, Jamati Islam of Maududi in Pakistan and the various Salafi-oriented groups operating from the West and funded through petrodollars. Now, this change actually the state's attitude towards religion significantly. We see this from a report commissioned by the Ministry of Community Development on religion and religious revivalism in Singapore submitted to the ministry in 1988. The result made it clear that the increasing religiosity of Singapore in general was potentially a threat to religious and communal harmony, especially within the increasing tensions as a result of aggressive evangelism and also a fusion of religion and politics, not just within the Muslim community, but also within the Catholic community particularly with the fear towards uh, liberation theology. Now, the government then saw that existing legal framework were insufficient. Singapore has three main laws that can and has been used uh, against religious perpetrators that are deemed as a threat uh, to communal or religious harmony. And these are firstly the Internal Security Act, which allows for detention without trial for those who are deemed as a threat to national security. The Sedition Act, for those who are deemed as causing ill will, hatred, or so dissension amongst the different religions of ethnic groups, including hate speech. And the Societies Act, which regulates societies or associations with the power to make them illegal by deregistering them. Uh, and this has been used, for example, towards the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, as a result of the changing context, where these laws were deemed insufficient to deal with the troublemakers, the troublemakers uh, in the eyes of the state, the, the state passed a new law in 1991. It's called the Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act, which allows for restraining order to be given to any religious preacher who are deemed to be causing harm to the state of religious harmony, uh, including uh, uh, mixing religion and politics in Singapore. Uh, and this Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act uh, actually gives uh, the power to bar her or him from entering Singapore, uh, if in the case of foreign preachers or from speaking or addressing to religious audiences uh, in mosques, churches, or from the pulpit, etc. Now, additionally, from the period of the 1990s onwards, uh, uh, a kind of harmony model was instituted where each religious community were now kept separate, uh, uh, kept apart, and secular public space expanded, uh, including regulating spaces that can be used for religious activities and limiting or disallowing religious symbols and expressions in schools. Uh, uh, any expression of religious diversity in public sphere is now uh, confined to symbolic gestures, like having all the ten religious leaders uh, appearing in public to uh, bless or, or recite uh, 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 prayers, join prayers together, or to celebrate festivities together. This is particularly the approach of the only state-sanctioned group, uh, interfaith group, the interreligious organization. In other words, similarities were now emphasized while differences were suppressed. Now, more significantly, 
the religious knowledge subject, which I mentioned was introduced in 1984, was, was abruptly stopped in 1989, and a new curriculum, civics and moral education, was then implemented, where the idea now is not so much of the moral person being grounded in religion, but rather a good person is a good citizen. Religious organizations were also encouraged to turn its acti activism towards more social welfare needs of their respective community, with the state promising funds and support should they now agree to become an extension of the state in providing welfare needs to society. We see from this period onward that many religious groups begin to focus solely on such activities such as uh, running orphanages, uh, elderly care, delinquent homes, etc. Now, but here's the problem. While the shift in policy has reduced some tensions emerging from the context of religious revivalism in the 1980s, it also created a situation of isolation where little interactions now occur across the different religious communities and ensuring that stereotypes are further entrenched and also suspicion of each other were deepened. And more interestingly, as Singapore's economy entered the globalization phase in full steam from the period of the 90s onward, the secular space was now strengthened and brought in new forms of diversity quite unseen previously. As the, market, uh, the labor market shifted to workers from all over the world, many of them adopting Singapore as their new home under a liberal immigration policy, new identities then began to emerge, either brought from a different context they come from or from the mobilization of new identity movements, including an expanding gay rights movement. Thus, while stereotypes were re reinforced across the different religious communities, new tensions also developed between the religionists on one hand and also the new secular movement. This new tension is best seen in public in 2009, where a group of evangelicals somewhat overthrow an entire exco of women's rights group uh, known as AWARE or Association of, Mus uh, of Women for Action and Research because what they perceive as AWARE's support for LGBT LGBTQ rights. The evangelical uh, complaint has been that the state, since its liberal economic turn in 1990s, has no longer played its role as a guardian of public morality and in fact opened up Singapore to moral downfall, especially with the divisive issue of allowing the opening of a casino in 2005. Before that, Singapore was adamant that casino cannot operate in Singapore because of its gambling factor. Uh, of course, other things were liberalized eventually, including bar top dancing, nude shows, and street parties, which, in, which is a significant move uh, in an otherwise uh, conservative society. And then there's September 11. If isolation and separation is the de facto policy of the state in, minim in minimizing conflict and tensions. September 11 calls for a new approach. The state realized that keeping communities apart not only entrenched stereotypes and prejudices and suspicions of each other that each community may have over the other, it also drives them deeper into the enclaves and thus away from public and state scrutiny. Therefore, in 2002, uh, the government formed what is known as the Interracial Confidence Circle. Uh, and later, as a result of the 7-7 London bombing, uh, this was expanded into interracial and religious confidence circle, or IRCC. Uh, the IRCC comprised of groups formed at constituency levels, comprising of religious er uh, leaders of the area, that means the mosques, temples, churches, etc., that are located within one uh, constituency, who maintain uh, with each other close contact and ready to be activated in case of potential conflict situation at the everyday level. And this includes, for example, tussle over burial rites. For example, someone has converted to another religion and then the family refused to accept that. So there's tussle between two communities, whether to uh, cremate or to bury according to, to their religious uh, understanding. Uh, or rumors circulating you know, of uh, certain things going on in society, even small things like uh, noise issues over religious worship, etc. So the religious leaders will, will be activated very quickly. Uh, all these are managed by the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, so that they can pacify their own uh, community and not let it get out of hand. And most of the time, tensions will resolve before the public even know it, ha it happened. Uh, of course, the, the larger framework of the IRCC is in case a, a bomb explodes in Singapore, uh, then there is a, a kind of mobilization phase where the religious leaders will then be activated to, to control the situation before the, 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 the uh, uh, followers go out of hand. 
Now, in 2005, a more systematic attempt by the state was introduced under the name of Community Engagement Program, or CEP, which aims to boost interfaith dialogues at the grassroots level by providing funds for groups or individuals willing to develop programs and activities in line with the new integrative approach by the government. Uh, lately, we've seen, as a result of CEP, a mushrooming of interfaith and dialogue efforts from the ground up, uh, but the scene is still largely uh, state-managed or state-controlled. The Muslim community seems to be uh, the most active at the interfaith front, which I think is due to two reasons. Firstly, the stress put on the community as a result of September 11 attacks and the discovery of an Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist cell in Singapore in 2002. And also, secondly, being a minority group, it cannot afford to not reach out to forge positive relations with other communities, particularly with the dominant uh, group, um, to protect uh, its own minority vul vulnerabilities. But with the burgeoning of uh, social media, many of these stereotypes and vindictive views towards other communities begin to come, come out uh, in, in the online platforms like Facebook. Yeah? Uh, and the state once again has to deal with it swiftly, uh, and they did, by reminding citizens that no one can hide behind anonymity uh, online, and there are instruments to eventually track those who make seditious comments and, and be charged in court. And within the last few, few years, the Sedition Act has been used for the first time after many decades against those who, who uh, uh, denounce another religious group or community uh, uh, using the online platforms such as blogs and Facebook. Now, one last point. In my personal view, the multiculturalism model of Singapore, while having served our society well in the past, is in need of serious rethinking. Because in wanting to manage the diversity across ethnic and religious identities, the state also has inadvertently created new false identities where ethnic and religious categories were seen in unique monolithic categories. Yeah? For example, take a Malay ethnic community. It's actually very diverse, but they all have been lumped together as Malay, Indian, Chinese, and others. Uh, uh, this is in the interest of having an easy reporting structure when it comes to Islam, for example, the state will consult the central authority, which is MUIS, and MUIS will in turn consult leaders from the various religious organizations. But this will also mean two things. One, the politics of representation becomes particularly acute because each group is now trying to vie for state attention and a piece of the pie in resources distributed by and through, through the state. And secondly, the state itself is often unable to appreciate the internal diversities and contestations within each religious community, leaving it susceptible to listen to dominant views as representative of an entire community despite disagreements within, uh, especially those who do not sus subscribe to certain interpretations of the religion and yet having no official voice to influence policy making at the governmental level. Uh, an example would be the Human Organ Transplant Act, which has been declared in a fatwa in 1970s as haram, as not permitted, uh, although there are uh, differing voices. Uh, but Moise only changed that, that fatwa and that move to include uh, Muslims within the Human Organ Transplant Act uh, only uh, within the last few years. Now, uh, this is where I think Singapore also has much to learn from other models, uh, as much as we got it right in certain aspects of the management of religious diversity, uh, we also have to learn from other models in order to further improve it uh, and, and make lives, uh, the religious life uh, bearable in our small and humble nation state. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, dear um, Imran. This was also a very interesting and enriching experience from Singapore. Taking into account that we have a little bit of overtime gathered, um, I would like to suggest, I mean, are there any pressing questions from the audience? Otherwise, I would ask our distinguished speakers to sacrifice their lunch. No. <laughs> to simply welcome every one of you to personal inter exchange and engagement with our speakers during the lunch break. Um, the lunch break is uh, anyway still um, until 4 p.m., so you have nearly one hour and a half. I think that would be sufficient. Thank you very much to my panel. It was the best that I could have imagined. Thank you very much for your attention.